My name is Dan Ritchie. I've been teaching at Bethel for 26 years. I'm the director of the Humanities Program, and I have a specialty in 18th century literature. At Bethel, I've taught a lot of survey classes, survey in British literature. I've taught a lot of general education classes as well. Uh, both on the freshman level and then the, the P courses. Uh, in a department like ours, we do have certain specialties. I teach more British literature, but uh, we, we teach all levels from uh, sophomore through senior seminar levels. I'd say my teaching style is perhaps a little more formal than, than others. I do think there's a strong place for delivering information, including in stand-up lecture formats, especially in the uh, freshman and sophomore level. Um, I try to mix that with uh, more seminar and discussion-oriented uh, classes, and especially in the upper level, I um, encourage a good deal of, of research um, for the uh, seniors and senior seminar senior seminar classes. Uh, students say that I have uh, high expectations um, and I think they respond well to that so that's that's part of who I am and uh, I've tried to um, lean into that as appropriate. Um, one of the things that's become more apparent to me over time is the importance of developing a small number of, of close relationships with uh, teaching assistants. So I've developed that as well. Um, another strength is uh, because I like organizing things, organizing projects, I've done a fair amount of study abroad experiences and that's a completely different kind of teaching, uh, much more experiential and uh, relational teaching. So there's, it's been a variety of variety of approaches. Well, building rapport uh, it really depends on the level and the kind of class that I'm teaching. If it's a, a humanities class where I'm going to be seeing the students over multiple semesters, having, um, having a good relationship in our smaller group seminars with uh, 22 students uh, is really important. So learning who is on the football team, who is in the Bethel Choir, who might be trying out for a play, and um, encouraging students to see that all of what we do at Bethel is significant. Um, I, I think that's important for building building rapport. Certainly learning students' names very quickly is important as well. I think students learn by making connections. Um, they have bodies of, of data that they can be tested on so they know this uh, term over here and they may know that trend over there but until they can connect them in some meaningful way I'm not sure that they really learn. Uh, let, me give, let me give an example. In an art history lecture that I just came from uh, Wayne Rosa was talking about uh, the architecture of the Puritan meeting house and how it's uh, an egalitarian structure. Well, that of course was uh, developed in the 1600s, long before an egalitarian political structure came about. Those people were all subjects of the king. But by the time we get to the American Revolution and our readings in uh, Tocqueville, the connection between that egalitarianism in church and equality in the American political system become very important. And if, if we can get students to see the connection between the architecture, the religion, and the politics of America, then they, they really learn. Yeah, in designing a, a successful new course, I think there needs to be a, a confluence of, of three kinds of interests. First of all, the, the students have to have an interest in taking the course. Bethel students really don't take 
electives very much at all. So the course has to fulfill their interest in completing a major or completing a general education requirement, or maybe two at once. So there's the student's interest. It also has to fulfill uh, the institution's interest. The institution has an interest in, um, in courses that uh, are somehow related to our mission, or the department has an interest in somehow furthering something that, that we think is very significant for our majors to do. Uh, the least important, the third uh, uh, leg of the triangle, is the professor's own interest. <laughs> but it has to be there, too. Uh, there has to be some reason why, uh, why I'm interested in teaching this class. And the most recent class that I've developed is a class on Islamic literature and culture. And like many people, I got more interested in this after 9-11 and really wanted to understand uh, more about Islamic culture. I had some connections through a brother and other connections through Bethel to the Middle East, so that was my interest. Bethel students need G and Z courses, and our uh, department had not been offering many courses, especially in that G category or the Z category. So that was kind of a perfect opportunity to develop a, a new course and drop some old courses in Renaissance and satirical British literature that students frankly weren't interested in anymore. So those, those three interests uh, I think need to come together. Your own interest, the students' interests, and the institutions or departments' uh, interests. In developing individual class sessions, I do tend to look back at what I've done in the past and then ask if it's going to work or if it can be changed or if it needs to be changed. And, and often I'll make notes right after a class ends and uh, tell, uh, tell myself what, what worked and what, what didn't. Um, again, I think there needs to be some, um, some hook uh, to, to show students why a particular element is significant or important uh, to them. Um, let, let me give an example. One, one of the more difficult things for me to teach is 18th century poetry. It's written in rhymed couplets, and students tend to think that these are easy to write and that they're boring. So getting, getting them to see the, the tension between the order and the energy within those couplets and, and the wit of those couplets is a task. So what's worked for me in recent years is to have students write their own heroic couplets. Uh, and then they see, they see how difficult it is, how fun it is, and they can appreciate the wit of those earlier writers. But it took me many years to come up with this idea and many years of failure uh, until I finally had to admit that simply standing in front of students and telling them about hero couplets was not going to work. Um, so in that case, it was a more experiential uh, element that, that ultimately worked. During individual class sessions, my focus um, goes between the material and the students, and I think I'm much, much better as a teacher if I know the material well enough so that I can be looking at the students eye to eye and, and see what their reactions are, because then I know if something's working or, or not. Um, I, I do come to class uh, with uh, set notes, sometimes uh, something close to a, a manuscript written out, or at least heavily annotated texts, and uh, there, there are almost always three or four uh, points that I want to raise, but um, I think when I'm teaching my best, I'm focused on whether the students are engaged with what they're learning, and if, uh, if they're not, then I usually stop and, and try to go in a, in a different direction.
Uh, I think the forms of assessment really vary from level to level. The higher the, the level, the fewer objective tests that I use and the more I rely on students uh, to read text without necessarily being assessed on everything. Freshmen tend to feel like they need to be assessed on everything or they won't, uh, they won't read the material, but upper level majors feel the opposite way. I think they'd feel insulted if they were tested on, on everything and they can be counted on to, to do the material without that. And since ours isn't a, a licensure, they're not going for a licensure, there's less of a need to, um, uh, to test on everything. However, I do still like, even in some upper level classes, to have some objective uh, questions uh, just to, for a little bit of integrity to make sure students are reading the material. Um, developing a, a well-focused paper topic is really quite difficult, I think. I, I do like to give students options, but um, the best paper assignments uh, are ones that I've had to develop and, and revise over years because there's always a student who will misunderstand something, not, not because uh, they're not trying, but because it's not written as clearly as it is. Um, and again, the, the best assignments I think are ones that force students to make connections, or I should say that uh, that allow students to make connections between the material they uh, have studied and their own concerns. That I'll give an example from a, uh, an essay question on a survey uh, survey of British literature. So this is a freshman or sophomore level class. We read a couple of essays on. Um, I guess you'd say the theory of literature, what poetry is, what poetry should do, even in this first level class. And one essay question that I've had some success with is to ask students to analyze works by Sir Philip Sidney and, and Samuel Johnson and Alexander Pope that have to do with what literature is, but then ask them to say, um, how does this material help you to love God with your mind? And so that more personal and subjective element for students who choose to write about that question uh, allows them to make connections between this material that's 500 years old and their own concerns. The course that was filmed was a session on a poem by Alexander Pope called The Dunciad. It's a mock epic, like the Iliad and the Aeneid, the Dunciad, but it's a, an epic about dunces. And this uh, poem was uh, written in the 1720s and revised through the 1740s. Now the students had already read a lot of satire, so I made a lot of assumptions about their knowledge of satire, their knowledge of this poet, and also Jonathan Swift, his contemporary. These are students who are mostly juniors and seniors or students who've already had a survey of British literature. So they will have already studied uh, Alexander Pope and other satirists of the 18th century. And many of them have also read either the Iliad or the Aeneid in other classes. So I, I was able to make a lot of assumptions uh, about things that they'd studied, possibly forgotten about, but uh, gently remind them of things that they'd, they'd already read. Um, I also knew that these particular students have a, a very good sense of irony, so they would, uh, with a few footnotes and allusions, they would catch a lot of the jokes. The purpose of this class, though, was to try to get them to see how significant the battle over culture was to Alexander Pope. I think that's why he's still valuable for us today, because he really thinks that the quality of a uh, a society's culture is of extraordinary importance. So sometimes I try to prime the pump by, by asking students at the outset whether it's more important for a culture to have good poetry or good medicine. And students think that the answer is obvious, uh, but uh, when I point out that almost no cultures had very good medicine until antibiotics, but there were good cultures, uh, then they, they can enter into that debate 
uh, more fully. And that's the context for Alexander Pope's Dunciad. Uh, when we do the, we do the papers on Swift and Pope, you may need to use the scholarly edition, you may not, but um, let's talk uh, sometime in the next day or two about putting these on reserve. Uh, this is the uh, Twickenham or Twickenham edition of, of Pope's poetry. And so this, this has both the 1729 Dunciad and the 1743 Dunciad. Woo! Uh, yes, <laughs> and uh, it has great footnotes. And uh, I've, I've marked a couple of places where these books began. So you can see Pope's satirical advertisement for the 1729 Dunciad, and then you can see the, all of the prefatory material, all of which is satirical, for the 1742 or 1743 uh, Dunciad. Um, let's do it the same way, General Rose. I'll start with you. And then, um, when I was in college, I had a friend who went to Yale, and in the Yale Christian Fellowship, there was a young man, not quite a prominent sociologist, who, who imitated the Dunciad in the year of the Bicentennial, which was 1976, and he calls it the Bicentenniad. So, in, in this case, the uh, people who are being satirized are Nixon and... Uh, various uh, political figures during 1976, and uh, he must have taken probably Maynard Max course in Pope at, at, yeah, very, very funny. Well, funny to, to some of us, anyway. So you can, you can see what a college student did uh, many years ago, over 30 years ago. Okay, just a couple of uh, uh, Bible verses that I'm going to uh, come back to in this, uh, in this class. Uh, the Pope's poem alludes to epic and it alludes to apocalyptic literature. And so um, I'm going to just remind you of a couple of verses in Revelation uh, that deal with the end of times. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, The whole world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Forever and ever. Right. This is... Uh, the great passage that Handel uses. And then Revelation 12, 17, about the ten-horned beast. You read about the ten-horned fiend in Book 3 of the Dunciad. Then the dragon became angry at the woman and declared war against all the rest of her children. That would be the church in Revelation, the upholders of culture in the way that uh, Pope appropriates it. And now in my vision I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, it had seven heads and ten horns. So uh, Pope makes use of a number of these and many, many more uh, references in Revelation and elsewhere in the New Testament to uh, kind of to allude to apocalyptic literature. And uh, we've talked about allusion in this class, and, and one of the questions I want you to ask is uh, the purpose the purpose of allusion as he's uh, criticizing contemporary culture. Okay, uh, now to begin. Uh, uh, with uh, the, the Dunciad is written and rewritten over over many years, and uh, in, in my view, it, it's about the cost of a healthy culture. So, uh, a, as in our previous work with with Pope's poetry, we're going to be talking about what it takes to create a healthy culture. Pope, of course, is doing it through poetry, and I think that's the takeaway value of uh, a lot of Pope's satire. What what does it cost? Why is it worth it? Uh, and what part can I play in it? Well, uh, there's an a, a engraver, very famous engraver and painter, William Hogarth, who lives at the same time as, as Pope and Swift, very uh, satirical uh, uh, painter. And uh, he has this painting of the distressed poet. And uh, I was just uh, searching the other day and, and found that uh, in the first edition of this engraving in 1740, he actually placed some of these uh, elements from uh, the Dunciad, actually one of the earlier versions, under this engraving. So I'll just read it for you. Uh, Studious he sat with all of his books around, sinking from thought to thought a vast profound. So he's seeking, sinking into the, do uh, you remember the word that Pope uses in uh, at Friday's class for the profound, the depths? He writes a book, Harry Bathos. Yeah, he's seek, sinking into them the bathos. Plunged for his sense, but found no bottom there. 
then wrote and floundered on in mere despair. So here's the poet uh, searching for something to write about. He's knocking off his wig here. It's about to come off. His baby is hungry, is lying, squalling in the background. Uh, this woman is, she's, she has all the bills that he hasn't paid, and his wife is doing her best to keep up with things, but her husband hasn't produced anything worth selling, and so they're, uh, they're deeper and deeper into, into poverty. So this is Hogarth's satirical um, engraving on the distressed poet. Okay, well let me say a word about the, the background to the Dunciad. We're going to go quickly through the first two books, then I'm going to get you into the small groups that I mentioned. Uh, I gave you various passages in the Dunciad to look at, right? Uh, so you'll get in your small groups as quickly as I can manage, and uh, I'll give you some time to think about uh, the key questions, and then we'll come back, come back together. So uh, let me say a word about the publication history of uh, this poem. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll talk about the, the different the different books of the Dunciad. Uh, first of all, first of all, the plot. The plot of the Dunciad is very simple, and as in most satires, plot is not really that important. Um, the plot is moving the seat of government, if you will, the seat of dullness, duncery, from one end of London to Westminster. So. Again, here's our, our map of London. You really need to know a little bit about London geography for, um, for the 18th century, certainly. So London ends about here. And uh, do, do you remember the uh, St. Paul's Cathedral is about here? Uh, do, do you remember the street where the poets lived? Grub Street is up here. That's where the poets or the hack writers live. It's not where Pope lives, of course. Uh, it's also uh, where what uh, what other what hospital is up here? Bethlehem. So Bedlam is up here. Bethlehem Hospital for the Insane is up here, and this is an area called Smithfield. And Smithfield gets mentioned in the opening lines. It's uh, referred to. So this is Temple Bar that separates London from Westminster, and this is where uh, to this day it's a more fashionable area. The, the theaters are in here, they're kind of on the edge, but this is where the court lives. So this is where the people with good taste should be. This is the city, <coughs> the city, which is like Wall Street, and, and this is uh, where you would expect people with not very good taste to live. So the plot is where the goddess of dullness moves from where she should be, which is in the city, Smithfield, to Westminster. That's all that happens. That's all that happens, moving her seat from one place to the next. That's the but. Not the most important thing about the poem. Okay, so let's look at the, the different uh, versions of the Dunciad. Uh, in the first versions, uh, the hero, in quotation marks, the mock hero, is Louis Tybalt. Uh, spelled Theobald, but pronounced Tybalt. And he's the one, you may remember, who criticizes Pope's uh, edition of Shakespeare. So he's another of many bad poets of the 18th century. And he's the chief dunce in the first uh, Dunciad. Uh, so there's three books in the first version, and then he produces a variorum edition. Do, do any of you know what a variorum edition of uh, literary work is? Variorum? Can you guess? It, well, uh, sort of. It does talk about variety. It includes all words. It includes all of the different variant readings, all of the different variant readings. So uh, poets are always changing uh, versions of their poetry. Have any of you compared uh, versions of uh, one poem that, that the poet wrote at one time in his or her life and then another version later? Have any of you done that in English classes? We're doing it in Shakespeare right now. Okay. Yeah, so a very arm Shakespeare is extremely helpful because you can see how the folio and quarto changes, right? So uh, a scholar wants to have a very orum edition of Shakespeare, a very orum edition of Yeats. Yeats changes. Uh, and so Pope gratifies the scholar's tastes by giving them a very orum edition of the Dunciad. So you have all of the different uh, variant readings of, of Dunciad possible. This is a book. This is a book that's a satire on books, and we've seen that elsewhere in this class, right? 
for instance, satires on books themselves. Oh, Battle Gulliver's Gulliver. Travels. The Battle of the Books, Gulliver's Travels, Tale of a Time. Virtually everything we've read <laughs> has, has been a satire on books themselves. So it's very self-conscious. The 18th century about the new print culture, as it's called. Um, all right. Then time goes by. Um, the poet laureate at the time, Lawrence Usden, yet another terrible poet of the 18th century, dies in 1730, and a true dunce is named to be the next poet laureate, Holly Sibber. It was, it was too, too wonderful to pass up. Okay, so time passes. Holly Sibber is now poet laureate. Uh, Pope writes a fourth book of the dunce, yes, so another four books. And then in 1743, he revises the entire work a year before his death, and makes Holly Sibber the chief dunce. And that's the version that you have. You have the 1743 edition. Actually, the story doesn't even end there. His friend William Warburton, I think I mentioned, uh, puts in new notes uh, sometime after Pope dies. And Warburton's notes are now part of the Dunciad, part of the things that we study in this poem. OK, so that's the publication history. It's helpful to know. Um, the uh, the uh, contents of the four books also are, it's not the most important thing, but I'll have to tell you, I found it very confusing to, to read the first time. In fact, the first couple of times I found it confusing to read. So here's, here's what goes on in the books, uh, just uh, for your information. Uh, in book one, the most important thing is that Kali Sibber is anointed to be the king of the dunces. Okay? He was made poet laureate in 1730, so this is a poem in praise of his, uh, uh, his kingdom. In book two, epic games uh, go on. Uh, as in any good uh, epic poem, there are epic games, and they celebrate his kingship. In book three, you have to have a visit to the underworld, right? Uh, you, you remember, I mean, any, any epic you've read, just give me a, an example of an epic that has a visit to the underworld in it. What? Aeneas. And uh, what happens when Aeneas goes down with the civil the underworld? Uh, maybe we'll ask Roberta or Joel. Their memories may be fresher. He gets a vision of... He does, yeah. Anchises uh, comes in later, having died. He sees Anchises. Doesn't he also get a vision of like, his goal? Like, his Exactly. He gets a vision of his goal. He gets a vision of Rome. And so, Kali Sibber, or the king of the dunces, gets, uh, gets some kind of a vision uh, in, in the underworld, like any good. Now, the underworld, could you pick up on what the underworld actually is in Book 3 of the Dunce Yet? It is the sewers. It is the sewers of London. Uh, so, <laughs> this being a modern... <laughs> Epic or mock epic, uh, it has to be realistic and uh, translate the underworld into the sword. Okay, and then in book four, uh, finally the empire of dullness expands not only to Westminster but to all of Britain and it buries everything in darkness. So um, by ending in darkness, by ending in darkness, how, how does that allude to a biblical theme? Anybody? By closing out the world in darkness, let's just think biblically about darkness and light, John. It's like the opposite of creation. It is the opposite of creation, exactly. It, it's the it, Pope is alluding to uh, creation and its opposite. It's it's kind of Augustinian, just to connect with uh, some other things you've studied, uh, because darkness, of course, will be the the privation, the privation of light in every sense, every metaphorical sense of that. Universal darkness buries all. So that's um, that's what happens in the four uh, the four books of the um, Dunciad. Um, let's see. The Dunciad uh, announces itself as a mock epic. Uh, if, if you read the prefatory material, we'll read the opening lines. It's clear that it is a mock epic. And so, like any good uh, epic, it has all kinds of uh, expected uh, elements. The title, Dunciad, like Aeneid and Iliad, it opens with an invocation. Uh, the muse that's invoked 
uh, is, uh, is going to be one of Pope's friends. Um, it alludes to uh, the Aeneid and Paradise Lost and other epics in many places, so there are many allu allusions to epics. Um, it has a sacrifice to the goddess, the, the goddess of Delmas, the queen of Delmas in Book One, and then Epic Games visit to the underworld and so on. So uh, clearly, this is a mock, mock epic. No question there. I want to talk about uh, a different a set of structures in the uh, Dunciad. Just call your attention to it. I think this is what makes it so uh, profound, really. And that is allusions to apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature, or as biblical scholars use the term, apocalyptic. Um, this heightens the significance of the Dunciad, in my view, because it, it makes it makes the reader consider whether we're coming to a crisis point in culture. That's what apocalyptic is about. Um, one of the former uh, Old Testament professors here at Bethel uh, summarized it very, very nicely for me. He said, apocalyptic is good news and bad times. Good news and bad times. It's not really about prediction, what's going to happen. It's about good news for God's people when they're suffering. And in Pope's case, that would be good news to people who care about culture at a time when culture is suffering. So he's, he uses all of these allusions to apocalyptic in the Dunciad, in my view, to, to strengthen his critique. And here, here's just a list of some of the ones uh, that I could get on, a, on an overhead. Sure. Uh, either 18th century or <laughs> earlier images of the Antichrist, uh, uh, images from biblical literature, not from Pope or not from poetry, but uh, uh, images in, in Western European art. Um, the, the goddess of Delmas rules in the Dunciad, and here's a, a picture of the, the great mother uh, who's mentioned in Revelation, uh, kind of a... Uh, a mock God the Father. And you notice she has the papal tiara on, the three crowns. Pope doesn't wear that anymore. Here's the seven-headed beast with ten horns. Um, so we have the goddess of Nolus, and then we have uh, Kali Sipper riding on these uh, dragons. He was the manager of, I believe it was Drury Lane Theater. Here's Sorry, when, when you say the prostitution of culture, can you just elaborate a little more on that? Well, it's like, uh, it's like what Swift talked about in um, Gulliver's Travels, La Puta, right? Book three, of, or Voyage three of Gulliver's Travels is about the prostitution of knowledge. And in, in this uh, poem, the Dunciad, uh, Pope thinks that the people who are in charge of culture, the poets, the theater managers, the scholars, are, are not doing their job. They're being untrue, they're being unfaithful to their calling as scholars poets, uh, theater managers. So uh, it's, um, it's a charge of infidelity. So Pope must have, must have some vision of what fidelity is, what true culture would be. And, and that's what, that's what it, it's our job to uh, discuss and find out. Uh, any other questions before I go on? Well, let's look at the opening, and I'll try to do this very quickly so you have uh, time to be together. Uh, let's just open at the very beginning, like at page 307 in the Williams version. Page 307. Um, this is the opening, so you would expect what in the invocation to an epic or mock epic? <laughs> The invocation of the muse, and did somebody say gods? Yeah. The gods, right? So the muse gets invoked, the gods are usually referred to somehow. Anything else in an invocation? An outline of the plot. The plot, yeah, the plot is announced in the very first line. Mm -hmm. So, April, you get to open. Kings, I sing. Say you, her instruments the great, called to this day by dullness, Jove, and fate. You by whose care, in vain decried and cursed, still dunce the second reigns like dunce the first. Say how the goddess bade Brian, uh, Britiana sleep, and poured her spirit o'er the land and deep. Okay, o'er the land and deep. The word deep is a very uh, important biblical word, too, by the way, uh, used in apocalyptic contexts. The, the beast comes up from the deep in Daniel and in <coughs> Revelation. 
Okay, so you have this mock trinity, dullness, Jove, and fate, and the mighty mother and her son, which is a mock, that's a parody of the, the father and the son. You have the mother and the son called to this work by dullness, Jove, and fate. Um, how does Dunst the second, that would be Kali Sivir, the new poet laureate, reign like Dunst the first, uh, the former poet laureate? Okay, um, Roberta, can you continue, please? In eldest time? In eldest time, ere mortals quit or red, ere palace issued from the thunderous head, Domus or all possessed her ancient right, daughter of chaos and eternal night. Okay, and chaos and eternal night comes from? Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. <laughs> if in doubt, yes. the answer is yes. Jesus or Paradise Lost. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's 18th century poetry. <laughs> okay, here's Paradise Lost, book one. Uh, all the while, sonorous metal blowing martial sounds, of which the universal host, host upsent a shout that tore hell's concave and beyond, fragmented the reign of chaos and old night. Chaos and old night is where Satan lives, it's hell. It's unformed creation and it's darkness. Unformed creation and darkness, that's hell for, for Milton. And everybody reading Pope will know that. And so this poem is about uncreation. Uncreation. It's not about the struggle between an obvious good and an obvious evil. That's, that's the kind of stuff we can, I think, more easily get into. We can understand that. Um, if there's a clear good side and a bad side. This is about... <coughs> This is about undoing creation. All right, so we go through book two. Uh, there are these various epic games. Uh, do you remember what they do in these epic games? What are the activities? Don't they tickle each other? They tickle each other. <laughs> they swim in the sewer. And they have a urinating contest. Did you get that? <laughs> Very junior high boy stuff. Okay. So that's their, uh, that's, their, that's their contest. Okay, now, uh, that brings us up to uh, book, books three and four. The Visit to the Underworld is book three, and then uh, the great uh, conclusion in book four. So I'd like you to, to spend um, at least 15 minutes, read the passage out loud, read your passage out loud, and, and continue to, to get into this poem. Pope is obviously having a good time criticizing the people he dislikes. But I think there's a serious uh, issue involved. And uh, it's the issue of, of culture. Uh, how, how is a good culture produced? He's talking about poetry and theater. But he's talking about and scholarship. He's talking about more than that. He's talking about our culture as a whole. So how is it, how is it produced? And do you think it's as important uh, as, or do you think it's important in ways, in the, the same way that Pope does? Or do you view it differently? Um, and a, a kind of a fun question. You can start here if you want. Um, what figures or groups should be satirized in today's Dunsia? Um, that, that, that might be fun, too. And it may, it may help to start there, because then you'll start, have to ask yourself if you think it's as serious as Pope, as Pope does. So here are your groups. Did I divide the Romanticism group in half already? No? no? Okay, good. So the Romanticism group, you have this, and everybody else... Has, uh, has these lines. So can you go ahead and get in your groups and let's get back together at 12.05. So you have a good 15 minutes. <coughs> if you want to go somewhere else, that's okay. Uh, you can make it inside and back out by 12.05. Uh, that's fine too. His beavered brow, virgin garland wears, dropping with infant's blood and mother's tears. O'er every vein a shuddering horror rise, winter and winter, shake through all their sons. All flesh is humbled, Westminster's bold race shrink, and confess the genius of the place. The pale boy senator yet tingling stands, and holds his bruises close with both his hands. Then thus... Since man and bees by words is known, words are man's prophets, words only teach him all. When reason doubtful like the senior letter points him two ways, the narrower is the better. Placed at the door of learning, youth to guide, we never suffer it to stand. Phony Trinity, 
Uh, he, he referred to the Trinity in Book One. Yeah. Okay, but the, the end is really great, so you should. You should <laughs> uh, she comes, she comes, the sable throw behold, a knight of evil, and a chaos old. Then why is morality? Morality is being guarded by by her by her false guardian. Yeah, so like she's in bondage. So that's why. Yeah. And then the chicane and things that I still don't know. Passport. 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 Passport.
inspiring almost to like read something like this because we know that bad culture exists all the time. Um, and so I like that. Because we're just never, I mean, you're never going to escape it because, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of like you always have to have something that's the opposite to realize that, oh, this is good and we like this. Let evil flourish that grace might abound. Sure. <laughs> right. Uh, well, the, the Pope does need, I mean, Pope was born at the right time for his particular kind of wit. Um, the, uh, well, there's, there's, so much, there's so much here, but we need to go on. Uh, the satire on criticism. There are a couple of, where's my Burns group? A couple of good lines in this, too. Tell us what Pope is saying about literary criticism here. Um, the main thing that we got from this was that I think that um, the critics of his day were really concerned with things that didn't really have much bearing on anything in the real world. So, like, how to pronounce Cicero. Is it Cicero or, or Cicero? <laughs> have any of you had Latin where they talk about this? They do they, talk about They, they do talk about this. Didn't they get rid of the Latin? No, got rid of Latin. Uh, yeah, but you could have had it in high school. <laughs> okay, let's look at uh, what, what page is um, that Cicero thing on? The Cicero thing is on 363. 363, yeah, you'll find that. Uh, contemporary critic Richard Bentley, whom we met in the Battle of the Books, he, he felt very strongly that it should be Cicero and not Cicero. Okay, and they still, I mean, my teacher talked about that uh, in college. Uh, when I learned those languages. And uh, to sink in Kano, A or A. Uh, okay, here's the deal. Let's let's go back to page 360. Page 360. Line 149. Then thus, since man from beast by words is known, words are man's province. Words we teach alone. Have you, have you had classes or read liter literary theories full of this, folks, uh, where an emphasis on one word will supposedly give you the key to unlock or deconstruct the meaning of an entire word? So instead of looking at the whole word, which is what Pope recommends in the essay on criticism, you're focusing on individual words and finding some, some key to understanding. As opposed to merely focusing on words, what, what is Pope? urging us. Um, what does he care about? This is not just a question for this group. He, he is, he, he's, he's concerned about deeper things. He's concerned about, yeah, uh, a, a kind of a humane life, a, a larger uh, humanity. Um, anything else you want to add? Um, he just says a lot of things on the last page on 364. I just love his line where he says, The critic eye, that microscope of wit, sees hairs and pores, examines bit by bit. And then later. What, what, what line are we? Okay. Oh, and yeah. then um, around 3. 233. Uh, Amy is uh, thinking of her uh, past history in biology classes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he says, um, The body's harmony, the demon soul, all things which cuts her vermin wash, you'll see when man's whole frame is obvious to a fool. It's just. Okay. It's this par partial knowledge that, that Pope is concerned about, as opposed to a, a broader, broader sense. So what Pope is calling for is a, is a critique of these uh, contemporary writers and contemporary intellectuals, and um, urging a, 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 a different kind of culture, a deeper culture, a culture where religion, metaphysic, um, and, and good taste uh, actually had a had a role, as opposed to the to the reign of the expert that only looks through the microscope, or the philologist that only looks at uh, individual words, and certainly not uh, the kind of sensual and spectacle ridden culture that uh, that Britain has at the time. Okay, well, thanks very much, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah, in the segment that was filmed, I thought the uh, classroom uh, presentation that I did about Pope's poem, The Dunciad, went pretty well. I felt like I had the students with me for most of that.
But then I broke them into small groups and had them look at different sections of the poem, and that didn't go so well, in my view. I, I think it's because um, it's a very complicated poem, and yet I felt like I wanted them to get certain things out of it in retrospect, and that's probably not the best way to do a, a small group exercise in class. So I, I would I would do that differently, have have the students um, do uh, sections of a poem where they're freer to find out uh, things on their own, and where I don't have a uh, an agenda for what they should get. Well, I'll start by uh, saying why I do them and why I like doing them. The first one I did was uh, an England term in 1991, so that was my sixth year at Bethel. And um, it took me that long to realize how important relationships really were between the professor and the student. And uh, that comes more naturally to other people, I know. But for me, it was that experience of, of uh, seeing the... Um, friendship, uh, the, the fun we had together, uh, um, working, working with the classroom experience that was uh, it really revolutionized my teaching. And so I like going back to that. It's like going back to the well and, and getting, getting refreshed every so often. Um, the other thing it made me realize is that the long-term relationships that I'll have with students come largely from those very intense experiences. And on, on my wall behind me are, are pictures mostly of students that I've taken abroad, not entirely. And um, when, when we get together, the conversation flows naturally about things we experienced at a particular place. So that association of, of place and intellect and, uh, and spirit, there's a lot of spiritual growth as well as just enjoyment. Um, now, in terms of organizing it, I, I would say that uh, taking a study abroad trip is not for everybody. You really do have to enjoy doing details, or your spouse has to enjoy doing details. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I'm pretty good with uh, organizing uh, logistics and, and envisioning what's going to come next. So it was, it's kind of a natural for me. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's, it's not for everybody. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's a, an important one uh, at, at Bethel for us to continue to think about. And I, I think there are three different ways that it works for me. Sometimes the course material naturally leads into um, some element of faith. And I'll give a, an odd example. Um, I always teach uh, Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon literature at the beginning of the school year, and um, the worst crime in uh, in that culture is um, starting a feud. And uh, so the, the biblical passage that they like the most is Cain and Abel. So the course material in that case gives me an opportunity to integrate the Cain and Abel story and show how it worked in that culture. So course material is one. A second is if I do sense some kind of pastoral issue in the class. It may be something that's happening at Bethel, or it may be, uh, it could even just be after a, a, a festival of Christmas, or uh, a lot of students being ill. So I may integrate uh, a faith and a prayer in that way. The third is more seasonal. Um, Bethel students sometimes respond to the liturgical year uh, because it's unfamiliar to them. And so I'll often bring up uh, readings uh, during Advent or Lent or lectionary readings from uh, one of the um, historic churches. Uh, so those three different ways, the seasons, sort of pastoral issues, and then uh, course material. Well, balance is always a, it's a topic that we talk about a lot and that we never really solve. Um, I do think part of it depends on your station in life. Uh, 
if, if you're married, you have certain uh, responsibilities. If you have small children, you have other responsibilities. Um, now our kids are grown, and so I do feel a little bit more of responsibility to, to do more uh, service in terms of committees and uh, and, and um, so a willingness to take on more in that respect. And uh, there were times uh, when I was doing more uh, scholarly work uh, where I didn't, uh, didn't do very much of that, or I did less. Uh, scholarship, I think, is the hardest for me, because I can't really do scholarship during the school year. And so I did a lot over the summers. Um, and again, uh, that uh, I think that's really important for a lot of people individually, and it's important to get ten, tenure and promotion to full professor. But um, I feel that there are times in life when uh, you can set that aside too, uh, and concentrate more on one than the other. So I guess my my short answer is there are seasons in life and times of of greater and lesser responsibility where you can give more attention to one than the other. And I think trying to do all three all the time is a, um, is a recipe for a breakdown. Uh, this is a great question. I, I really do look forward to the beginning of the school year. And I, I think it's, uh, because I realized that if I were uh, uh, working on my own, um, all, uh, if, if I were only working on my own or if there weren't an a academic year coming up, I'd be lonely and melancholy and depressed. <laughs> and so I recognize that I, I, I like students. Um, uh, it's, I don't continue to teach primarily for uh, scholarly purposes. Uh, I think that's valuable, but it's, it's, for me it is not the primary focus. Um, but I, I, have a, um, I have a strong sense of, of duty as well, and I think uh, we have a duty, um, a duty as Christians living in a democracy to educate uh, the generation so that they're uh, responsible. I mean, it's kind of a basic citizenship thing. So when I see 130 uh, humanities students uh, carrying Tocqueville under their arms or uh, Lincoln or uh, Frederick Douglass, I think we're doing a good thing. And seeing them get involved in the, um, those discussions uh, is, is really thrilling. Or seeing students get passionate about poetry for the first time. Uh, I love to see that. Um, so it, it really does come down primarily to uh, being able to see students catch, uh, catch the fire of the intellectual life. I, I do have some advice on the first year. The first, for the first year at Bethel, I would say get some good advice on developing an interim course because interim can be um, a real uh, pain if you, uh, if you aren't teaching something that you enjoy and something that actually works in 16 class days. So you have your first interim off, uh, get a good interim course. For the fifth year, I remember John Lawyer said something about the five to seven year uh, period of discontent uh, or of questioning, and it's kind of like a marriage, really. And he he compared it to um, being in a monastery. Uh, monks have to renegotiate their relationship with the institution, and I think that's true for us as well. I think at that point, you need to ask yourself if you're willing to bend your interests to the interests and the culture of of this institution, because there things will have come up in those first five years where you see that the institution is different from your own background. And if you're not willing to bend in certain ways, then it, it may be time to move on. And uh, if you're willing to uh, undergo the, the strain of changing, 
then that's a that's a good sign. But uh, but just recognizing that necessity for the fifteenth year, I would say it's it's time to it's time to to lead or reinvent yourself. When I look at the people at Bethel who are doing um, the most valuable things or, or seem the happiest, it's because they've they've changed their job in some way um, that fits with the institution and fits with themselves. So in our department, uh, Thomas Becknell has really contributed to the environmental studies program. Um, we, we all know how uh, Dick Peterson has uh, established relationships with companies and schools. I think this, this way of reconceiving your vocation is, uh, is something that all of us can do and, and probably need to do. It could be leadership inside Bethel or it could be um, some way we relate to the community or the world. But I think that's a pretty natural uh, cycle. Uh, when I look back at the things that have uh, provided refreshment for me, um, they, they all do come down to paying attention to and following my own interests within the context of Bethel. So um, for me, leading students abroad has been tremendously refreshing. Uh, they really can't get at you with email when you're <laughs> abroad uh, if you don't turn your computer on. Um, taking students abroad. Uh, secondly, team teaching has been a tremendous refreshment. Uh, to, to find uh, faculty who have s somewhat like minds, but uh, different approaches to these uh, various subjects and different ways of teaching, for me, that has been uh, hugely refreshing. So um, f finding ways that, that your own interests intersect with Bethel's and then uh, following them in, in new ways is what's been best for me. Well, I, w I would be happy if, if uh, some form of the humanities program continued. Uh, and the program isn't as important as just the, um, the passion of students to enter conversations that have been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. That, that is what got me interested in higher education and in reading in the first place. And if there's a way that I can pass that on, uh, that's, that's what I would love to be my legacy.